Yeah. So I'm not yes. Sir. Yes. Uh, thank you again, everyone, for joining. Uh, we are starting with the second session, session number five for the day two of FDP, and welcome you back again from this uh, wonderful session we had in the morning. A primer, uh, I can say, towards uh, alternative energy, especially in uh, the domain of uh, using solar as a, a source of energy. Uh, very well conducted by our former speaker, uh, Dr. Anaga Patel. And uh, now we have uh, Dr. Adinath Kunde with us. Uh, he's another bright uh, faculty we have in the university. Uh, Dr. Adinath obtained his PhD from Pune University, which is now Sathrai Pune University, uh, from the Department of Physics. He has worked as a visiting postdoctoral fellow in the years 2013 to 14 at Alto University. <laughs> Uh, where he worked on uh, uh, hybrid structural solar cells. Uh, currently, he is uh, associated with the Center of Energy Studies, formerly School of Energy Studies, as assistant professor. Uh, he is in charge of the solar uh, photovoltaic and energy studies, uh, storage initiatives of the department. Uh, his broad, uh, broader research interests are renewable energy conversion uh, and energy storage. His present research includes low-cost alternative materials for solar photovoltaics, battery electrode materials on sodium ion chemistry, and iron flow batteries. He is a member of several professional organizations, and there are many versatile things which uh, Dr. Adinath can himself share sometime. And he will be also uh, looking forward to questions from other participants. Uh, I would just like to uh, inform uh, Dr. Adinath that uh, in the previous session, uh, there were quite a few queries which were more in, in depth, which uh, Dr. Anaga said that you will be covering. And uh, now you have already uh, some three uh, determined questions for you as well. So uh, <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining. And over to you, Dr. Adina. Uh, just a minute. Uh, I request all participants to share in your queries and questions in the chat box of the Q&A session. And uh, uh, Dr. Adina, if you suggest, we can have a break at uh, uh, in one hour, wherein you can take the questions which have come up so far. And right. then uh, we can continue it. Uh, otherwise, at the end, it becomes uh, slightly uh, too many questions to uh, uh, follow up. So, so uh, we'll, uh, what we'll do, Swapnil sir, is like, uh, for example, if we are planning for a break, uh, let's not uh, stretch it beyond 10 minutes. Sure, sure. Yes, session. yes. Yes, yes, and definitely. Yes, and, and if it... Then again, further question ask. Q&A, I think that is most, uh, I mean, a good part of it. Otherwise, yes. uh, the slides and uh, I mean, just promoting my agenda is not <laughs> good in my view. So uh, interaction is most important. What is right, right. where is uh, where the I mean that's what is the prime motive in my view. Exactly. Okay, exactly. So we'll follow that. Yes. So uh, I'll suggest uh, uh, you take a call when you have to take a pause. And if right. we have que questions and queries, we'll uh, uh, have that session for ten minutes. If not, we'll continue. So uh, as of now, I can see that the session is planned till uh, uh, say uh, how much one o'clock, right, sir? No, sir. It's uh, till one thirty. So we are okay. expecting. Uh, like 90 minutes of a talk and half an hour of uh, Q&A. We can break the Q&A in between as well, as uh, as you feel deemed that this is a time where questions can be taken so, up. Uh, let's go with the, uh, I mean, say, a plan of, say, 12.30, uh, we'll have a break, meaning yes. first Q&A session, first Q&A section, and uh, yes. then second Q&A will go for uh, the last 15 minutes or 20 minutes at the most. Definitely, definitely, yeah. absolutely fine. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank okay. you so much, and over to you, Tavina. Thank you, Dr. Supnil. Uh, it was, uh, I mean, uh, just, I mean, uh, very long introduction, which was not necessary. Uh, but uh, despite, yes, we are, I mean, uh, we are uh, on the same, under the same umbrella of I mean, School of Technology. Yeah. So uh, we already have started some of uh, joint activities, and this one is one of them. So uh, looking at this uh, present activity of FDP, uh, I learned that uh, Somnath sir has already uh, given us a broad idea that it's a heterogeneous group. Uh, there are engineers who are from biotechnology group and other engineers who are from mechanical as well as computer science. So looking at this heterogeneous aspect, uh, so what I have decided is to have a small uh, introductory topic and also uh, which is energy uh, as a prime uh, kind of thing and uh, obviously the theme that 
things that I will be sharing with you all are something like energy stories. Uh, I thought it will start to, I'll start with solar energy, but much past is already covered by uh, my colleague, Dr. Anaga. Uh, so what I thought I'll just go for, uh, just in just for, I mean, instead of going just for incremental section, I thought I'll go for uh, directly switch to another topic called energy storage. Uh, and also something you always uh, learn these days as smart grids. So, uh, so something of that sort will be again. I have uh, just now I have thought of and uh, I have planned to uh, have uh, kind of interaction with uh, all the participants. So I'll start my uh, start sharing my screen. Yeah, here we go. So uh, the electrical energy storage, obviously most of us are very much convenient with inner uh, comfortable and uh, it's being the very convenient form of energy, uh, the electrical energy. And why do we need call, I mean, uh, intervention of something called as storage? And uh, I'll just certainly come uh, introduce you the topics or uh, concept called as a smart grid uh, so what do we mean by smart grid? Obviously, for some of them, it is very, very kind of very, very preliminary. I'm sure of it because whoever is electrical engineer, they are far beyond the understanding and they are already uh, addressing the gray areas of smart grid uh, actualization. But uh, looking at the, I mean, uh, the again, in motive and intention of these uh, uh, interactions. So I'll uh, give very much uh, kind of introductory concepts to that uh, 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 to that say okay so let's start with very much uh, good news of uh, this january uh, on the very first day our uh, minister of power have given a twitter uh, uh, kind of message that power sector rewind of 2021 we know we are going through a very bad turmoil of uh, pandemic and so does every sector is affected by that kind of pandemic but looking at the scenario <coughs> an, an aspiring nation are we really coming back to our uh, normals kind of scenario or are we just into this uh, new normal scenario so looking at the rewind highest all india demand of 2021 was observed to, to be 200.57 gigawatt 200 gigawatt on 7th July 2021. So looking at the present scenario also. Uh, so this is all time high actually. So and uh, we are aspiring nation and our, our economy is certainly doing, uh, I mean, uh, looking at the GDP figures, GDP growth rates. So we are doing much better in, my, in our I mean, uh, global con context. And looking at this scenario, if we are talking about uh, uh, so very preliminary concepts called as uh, uh, energy conversion, uh, okay, from primary sources to consumers. Uh, basically, what what happens? What is energy? It's everything, right? You need a virtually for everything. I need that energy for talking with you people, right? So I'm utilizing my computer device, other peripherals. Util utilizing some uh, communication means, communication uh, ways that also utilizes energy and you at, you at your end also are utilizing very similar kind of energy conversion devices. If my uh, uh, tube light here is switched off, you will virtually see that I'm in a darkness, right? So energy is required for everything. We need it for everything and looking at the human development index the energy consumption per capita is surely an indicator that how much is, I mean, how much that nation and it, its individual uh, on the, in that nation is using energy for, right? So we need energy for everything. Okay, so now we are looking at the classification of energy, primary energy and secondary energy. Primary energy is, uh, okay, so the, the form of energy, which is used as it is, for example, uh, the stored form of energy the crude oil, maybe the coal, and maybe some other forms of energy. So these are some primary forms of energy. Okay, so uh, so technical progress and development from prehistoric times were associated with the 
TT, uh, sorry, rather quant quantity of energy used. Okay, so more than two thirds of overall uh, quantity of uh, say uh, more than this uh, terawatt. So it's huge number, hundred thousand terawatt hours, right? So his it's huge number. Uh, but nowadays you can see that um, the present primary uh, energy consumption is sixteen terawatt hours, right? So it's huge number, right? So uh, uh, okay, so as of now, what we can see, it's a, uh, a mix of uh, all kind of sources that includes your primary energy sources, uh, which are uh, mainly the fossil fuel based, meaning these are conventional sources. But looking at the uh, criteria of sustainability, as UN has uh, given, given us the charter of 17 sustainable development criteria, Energy is may, uh, I mean one of the aspect, and uh, when we are talking about uh, energy, almost seven uh, criteria, sustainable development criteria, are directly or indirectly impacted by energy use. Right. So energy is prime uh, kind of uh, motive for all other things, uh, all other uh, developments. That is okay. Okay. So energy occurs in a variety types, uh, variety of types. Right. Oh, okay, so we have some fuels which are already fossil fuels. That's what we talk about. We we are fortunate, but there is a lot uh, to be um, kind of analyzed uh, when it is related to those sources. Okay, so uh, the sources of energy are say kinetic energy, potential energy, uh, electrical energy, then uh, say gravitational energy, the radiation energy that we receive uh, from sun. Right. So all these are forms of energy. Right. Uh, OK, so let's uh, understand uh, the uh, uh, energy uses by human. Right. So what this uh, plot says, it's a average power consumption per capita. OK, so what this y axis is, it's a average power consumption. I'm sorry. Okay, so okay, so this y axis is average power consumption per capita. So, uh, what is this? This is again logarithmic scale. Huh? Uh, what is this y axis? Uh, sorry, x axis. X axis is time relative to present. So, we are here at 2022. And if you're looking at prehistoric time, obviously, this is not flat. Huh? This is being uh, scaled into logarithmic scale, it appears flat, but it's a marginal increase that we one can observe. But once this uh, industrialization started, after the industrialization and globalization, okay, so these are two different concepts. One one can discuss much more on that. Okay, so industrialization and globalization of that has led to tremendous increase of the energy consumption per capita. So we can scale it from this to this as a quantum jump. Obviously, this is again very short span being it appears as if it is a vertical jump itself. So it's again very uh, being uh, so this is very short uh, span itself that has jumped to a, a quite large. So wh what was the demand? Earlier, the demand was very much small. Okay, so prehistoric time, it was just for food, shelter. And later on, uh, other kinds uh, things of how we want. So what do we need nowadays? We need energy for this, that and everything, right? So this has in a, a tremendously put uh, a pressure on the present in, uh, energy demand of the humankind, right? Okay, so uh, I'll not go much into this uh, plot because it's, it essentially tells you the same thing that we have discussed on the previous plot itself. But looking at the small, small, uh, small span of the say so 1800 okay so this x-axis is uh, the time 1800 uh, AD to 2019 okay and how, what is this y-axis it's uh, primary energy consumption again primary secondary say I mean uh, let's not get into that but primary is almost everything that's what we can say okay so primary is uh, total energy consumption for our for, for now just uh, uh, bear in mind please that it's a total energy consumption of the world so how it has evolved a uh, huge jump right but if we are talking about uh, uh, different kind of uh, 
distribution, say in the year 2019 itself, the first thing was this traditional biomass. Traditional biomass has, the, the use of traditional biomass has marginally decreased. But at this other, looking at the other total energy consumption, the demand has con consistently increased. For example, after this traditional biomass, biomass is wood, what, what is used for um, um, majority of the rural households for uh, their livelihood. It's a biomass, okay? And second resource that has been used is coal, then oil, and then the gas, and so on, nuclear, then hydropower, then solar, wind. Nowadays, many other renewables has started coming to picture. Okay, so that's good news actually. So that has evolved just in the recent past itself. Okay, so to give you a number, so how much is the total energy mix of uh, India? Okay, we just now have uh, noted the peak demand. It was 200 gigawatt, right? More than 200 gigawatt. But as of now, what is total capacity addition by these renewables? It's just now we have crossed 100 gigawatt of installation, renewable installation. That includes wind and solar. Okay, so traditional and other uh, rather hydroelectricity, if we are talking about nuclear is also supposed to be uh, renewable. So all these will add to other further capacities, right? So as of now, even if we are looking at, okay, this is a I mean, uh, this is a worldwide uh, actually uh, uh, consumption, worldwide scenario, right? So we now certainly can uh, uh, note it and the demand is continuously rising. Huh? So it's the, essentially the same thing uh, that we are talking about. But if we go further and try to analyze how much is the contribution from different uh, sources of the in this, this primary, okay? So primary energy is what? That includes coal, natural gas, hydro, nuclear, oil, and other renewables. Okay, so looking at this, the coal, 27%, then natural gas, something like 24%, then uh, oil, 34%. So if you add this 27 plus 24 plus 34, more than 85 or 87, 84, uh, so 80 to 85 percent is typically the contribution from these fossil fuels. Okay, so that is primary energy. Well, for primary energy, we can uh, say that uh, say uh, uh, primary energy consumption sectors. Okay, the transport sector, the residential sector, the commercial sector, and industrial sector. So all these four sectors are consuming energy. But out of that, if we talk about transport sector, transport sector is heavily dependent on the fuel called as oil, right? And very uh, small uh, dependence is on coal for, for uh, trains and other kind of uh, transport, railway transports, right? So transport sector is 90 to 95% dependent on these uh, conventional fuels only, right? Uh, residential, the electricity is utilized. Okay, residential, uh, since electricity, uh, let's talk about this plot then now. When we are talking about electricity generation of the world, then it's mainly coming out of your coal. Then 23% gas. Coal is almost 40%. Gas is almost 25%. Then hydro and other are contributing to as 20%, uh, almost then uh, nuclear is 10%, solar PV has certainly risen to say 7% as of now. Okay, so this is a 2019 figure. Uh, so looking at this present scenario, our uh, demand is growing, we are always talking about it. We are talking about it, and we are talking about it, and we are talking about it. Is this the scenario? No, we do not inherit the earth from our parents. We borrow it from our children, right? So there has to be a very much uh, kind of uh, motive with us that uh, and if, if we try to analyze the present energy sources, the current global energy trends in energy supply and consumption are not sustainable. They are unsustainable environmentally because they are polluting, economically because they cost a lot. 
for example when we i want to have a, a drive of a uh, i mean lavish car it consumes some fuel right and that fuel we do not we a uh, country uh, we, india as a nation we do not own that in it only of such oil resources we have to depend on other nations okay so it costs to our pocket as well as to our economy's pocket the national uh, reserves are utilized for that resources are utilized for that socially because they are dictating our uh, uh, fuel prices right so socially it is not good so it equitable distribution of these present energy sources is not there okay so we have several other thing i mean rest of the things are already uh, known to us so i'll not uh, give anything of this for example environment and other other kinds of uh, things are already there so uh, <clears throat> so uh, energy flows in world for example if we talk about uh, what is the uh, okay present energy demand of india was recorded electricity obviously that was total electricity demand uh, but what are other resources that are available to us obviously we have 16 terawatts of demand i just now told you overall uh, i mean world's uh, demand is 16 terawatt but solar radiation receiving on our earth is 170000 terawatt right sorry please go ahead sir please go ahead ah, all right all right yeah so uh, so it's not i mean this is the i mean potential of different uh, energy resources that are available to us that obviously most of them uh, which are listed over here are the renewables Uh, just to have comparison or looking at the best possible or sustainable uh, kind of uh, choices okay so um, we know that uh, okay so we need not uh, uh, see these numbers as of now because uh, my colleague has already covered much of it yeah so solar energy is abundant one and uh, so looking at the present scenario okay so uh, let us get a holistic picture when we are talking about uh, okay this is nothing but comparison of artificial and natural power flows so natural power flow comes from sun basically right and uh, we are utilizing most of it so first is what the solar radiation second is what the power installation of the total so comparing with this to solar radiation that is received on earth the total installation of power capacities throughout the world is 0.01% right the number 3 number 3 is what the tidal power tidal power itself is 0.05% of the present uh, uh, i mean uh, that uh, uh, comparison right so wind is 0.035% then evaporation uh, meaning that uh, the hydroelectricity that can be harnessed the potential is that much then they say there are several other things okay so it's again uh, what is happening okay let's go to this figure that will make the whole picture obviously that was pictorial representation but this gives little of uh, little bit of um, systematic uh, power flow okay so here we start with uh, the solar radiation some of it is reflected what the most some of it is already uh, received on earth that is uh, uh, experienced in the form of heat heat can be reradiated and that also can be utilized for your evaporation again uh, there are other power flows okay so it is just for heating of earth surface and the evaporation these are two things that are happening okay so now this is nothing but your heat right so heating uh, re results into wind at the same time we also receive uh, the evaporation in the form of precipitation uh, in the form of rain and thus power flow comes into so rivers oceans and ocean waves then uh, uh, the moon moon position okay so that results into tidal high tide low tide okay so these are tidal resources okay so this gives us holistic picture okay so when we are talking about the present uh, current flows right uh, but at the same time we also have another branch called as uh, photosynthesis 
uh, maybe the fossil fuels are also supposed to be a derived form of your photosynthesis okay buried uh, biomass is something called as fossil fuel okay so at the same time we also can envisage that uh, geothermal and fossil fuels okay so fossil fuel um, those are already um, there as a reserve instead of the current uh, flow of these uh, balance or balance of these energy flows okay yeah so uh, we have uh, interconnection between energy producers and consumption let us have quantum jump from this uh, holistic picture to what is actually happening with us we just now come back to our uh, room and let's see what is there okay so what we are receiving is electrical energy right so electrical energy is coming from certain power stations the power stations are say nuclear power station the uh, coal based power station power, uh, power plant or a nuclear power plant for example uh, what is uh, i mean uh, okay tarapur uh, uh, taps right taps uh, is having a installation of nuclear power station so at the same time we have wind turbines we have solar pv power plants okay so all these are producing electricity and having connection interconnection and and that energy is coming to us uh, uh, at our terminal at our disposal right so and we are utilizing it for several purposes like for industry for urban their residential and commercial that also comes comes into picture and at the same time the industrial residential and commercial and the transportation all these are now utilized now as of now the transportation was heavily dependent on something else but now nowadays we are shifting towards electrical powered transportation system right so this will also be shifted to effectively the electricity right so uh, i mean there is an interconnection between the production and end use what is that called as that is nothing but electrical grid an electrical power system is an interconnected network designed for electrical energy generation and delivery from producers to consumers okay so the picture is very simple what the producer the transportation and the end user is that the uh, grid is all about yes essentially yes but it also has to have several other components let's see what it is okay obviously we talk about uh, the historical development it started with uh, say uh, first ac supply was uh, started in uh, uh, usa uh, they say it officially it was 1886 where the uh, uh, the uh, massachusetts uh, 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 the uh, the uh, in that location the ac electric power system was installed it was interconnection of the generators and end users so 1886 there is historical development which we are not interested okay so i'll be sharing these slides with uh, your uh, team so that uh, it will be ready learning we can go through but let's go to the next topic that i have okay so uh, let's summarize what is an electrical grid it has okay it's a simplistic picture now right a power plant then uh, it has end users right so end users can be your household demand or factories or some malls or whatever as a end user right and obviously uh, the power plant so now we will be shifting towards demand and supply so is the demand matching or other is the uh, supply matching the demand we will be looking at okay so there are some intricacies coming into picture now right so uh, so apart from one power plant there can be other power plants uh, and the consumer cells okay so let's have this as a small picture of uh, this um, oval shape okay so uh, this is what the storage facility why do we need intervention of storage yes we are going to see that in the next slide that the the that the difference between supply and demand will demand 
the intervention of energy storage, right? So it's a simplistic picture of a grid, right? So is that very simple? No. The picture is very uh, complicated. Although here it says that uh, we have a coal-based power plant, then we have a nuclear power plant, then a hydroelectric power station, then medium-sized power plants also are there. Then, then industrial power plants are so they have their own captive power plants in some cases, right? So all these are connected together, and we have a grid. Uh, not grid as I mean at the moment we have a transmission facility. Okay, so extra high voltage transmission facility, then high voltage uh, uh, facility. Okay, so extra high voltage. So uh, power is what the multiplication of current and voltage. So let's not worry about that power factor at the moment. But what is power is nothing but voltage times current. If you want to have transmission of very high power and uh, you are having some voltage of say 200 volt that's what we are getting at our uh, household right then in order to have 200 uh, say for example 200 uh, uh, terawatts of power uh, let's not if not uh, 200 terawatts uh, let's talk about one kilowatt and uh, 100 kilowatt size of your power itself. So uh, when we are talking about 2.5 kilowatt of power flow, how much is the current? 2.5 divided by 230 approximately. So it will be approximately 10 amperes. But when that kilowatt gets translated to uh, say uh, uh, megawatt and gigawatt, the current, uh, the size of current becomes huge, right? So what is required is that you uh, up the voltage so that the current comes down, right? So current is problematic because every conductor has finite resistance and that finite resistance always leads to heating. Right. So that resistance is, uh, I mean, rather, uh, the what is the outcome of that resistance? We effectively joule heating. Right. So that heating will lead to, uh, uh, I mean, loss of power. Right. And as you go on increasing the current, the heating, the quantum of heating will be increasing. Right. So we need to have smaller amount of current and highest voltage. So that that is the extreme high voltage. That is the requirement of. Uh, high voltage transmission systems. Okay, you again step it down to high voltage and effectively at some uh, transmission grid, you uh, at the distribution network, you step it down to say KVs, 11 KVs, 50 KVs, these will be the demands. And you further step it down to these transformers. So this is essentially a, uh, note, a notation of a transformer and that will come down to a smaller uh, size of this thing. So at the same time, nowadays what is coming into picture is uh, solar PV rooftop installation, for example. Uh, wind farms are already coming into picture. Solar farms are already there. Then industrial consumers, they have their own uh, captive, uh, captive uh, power supplies. Maybe DC set and other things are also there, right? So, uh, and city power station, city power plants are also there, okay? This is, I mean, is this a, again a very simplistic picture? No. A grid has. Now, what is this? Again, it is a picture collected from Wikipedia, but a network diagram of high voltage transmission system showing the interconnection between different voltage levels. So, uh, the, the, uh, the first one is 380 kilovolts. Then we have transformers, right? So, here it is a, a transformer then we have stepping down to 220 kvs so it is drawn up to this level only if you go for uh, lower level uh, systems this network uh, obviously will not be that much simple okay so a grid uh, it's a grid right and um, is that simplified uh, simplified grid no it has several components uh, for example if you talk about this side uh, we have this much picture that has been shown over there. 
and if you talk about uh, another uh, part of that grid it will have another uh, components of the grid okay so let's uh, move towards another uh, concept called as electrical energy storage so the very first question why do we need intervention of energy storage right so we are going to revisit that question now so so electrical energy storage okay so this is typically electrical energy demand variation in india so what is this y axis obviously i have given you a highest number it was 200.37 gigawatt so what are these numbers these are 110 gigawatts and 135 gigawatts this is typical variation of electrical energy demand and uh, so what is this the variation right so it's typical variation of electrical energy demand in a day so what is it this is time night 12 o'clock 1 1 am 2 pm 3 am sorry i'm sorry about that uh, night 12 am 1 am 2 am 3 am and at 4 am we have morning dip so the demand here is somewhere like 115 no 115 is already here so we have 112 gigawatts demand okay so electrical energy demand here at morning 4 am is 112 gigawatt it is on typical day for example i have not noted the day over here but you can also get this data eventually okay so uh, our power grid corporation of india has i mean they give us data every hourly data daily data every reports are already available okay power grid corporation okay so here the demand is lowest one at the morning 4 am but as time progresses from 4 am the demand surges and we reach the maximum of say 9 to 10 that is the maximum again the noon time we have a small dip and in the evening there is a huge surge and the maximum of that day is 135 i have given an example this typical maximum can be of 100 Uh, not 100 but 200 gigawatts also so this is 135 gigawatt but on some fine day it can be as high as 200 gigawatt and then again uh, it comes down okay so uh, if this is at evening 7 o'clock so somewhere between 6 to 7 we have maximum energy electrical energy demand okay so what is that relative variation what is the minimum minimum is 112 at what time morning 4 am what is the maximum the maximum is at 200 gigawatt or for this picture let us say 135 from 100 to 135 approximately that's what i'm thinking so it's a huge jump right there is 30% or almost 35% variation in the demand right so the power supply has to match this demand or power sources has to uh, match the demand and moreover uh, what is another thing is that uh, peculiar thing it's i mean there is a way a short span within this time itself the demand rises and again falls down so it poses tremendous pressure on the grid operators right so uh, so this is typical demand variation in india we have another uh, uh, demand variation for example electrical energy demand variation in usa so uh, california this is particular uh, region california there they have demand variation something like this something like our variation but looking at the say uh, uh, so uh, obviously it is under, uh, for different years over the year it has uh, shown that the variation <coughs> widens right so the minimum and maximum is getting changed so there comes a alarming situation 
Okay, so what happens? Okay, we have seen the de uh, demand uh, variation of India. We have seen demand variation of uh, say USA, some typical state of USA and electrical energy demand variation in Sri Lanka. Let's consider one more uh, neighbor uh, who is Sri Lanka. Okay, so there also the demand varies like this. So for any electrical grid for that matter, there is certainly a variation in the demand. So obviously we, what we need to have intervention is of storage. So there is certainly a need of storage. Okay, so what our power plants can do, uh, for example, I'm giving you this speaker. Okay, so uh, obviously lit this is a little bit technical, but please bear me for a while. That So what is this plot? A and B, these are two plots. A is current generation mix and B is generation mix with energy storage. So uh, this is a weekly load curve of typical, typical power utility. And these are for eight days, uh, not eight days, but seven days. One, first day, second day, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh day. Okay, so on these seven days, this is Monday and this is Sunday. So daily variation is also not constant, right? So on Saturday and Sunday, the variation is different. Okay, so this is what the variation. Y-axis is uh, say uh, so percentage of system load capacity. So 100% loaded is somewhere here. We cannot have that much bottle to neck uh, kind of relation. So we'll as uh, I mean uh, I mean always uh, have a demand at 90%. So reserve peaking. We have some power plants. If the demand surges beyond this, we have some reserve peaking power plants. So those will be switched on. So that I mean the demand must be sufficed by the generation or supply, right? So therefore, there are some reserve peaking power plants, and there are intermediate power plants, and there are base loads. So at no time the supply of electricity from the grid or power stations can fall below this baseline baseline base load right so what what is uh, done over here in those base loads okay let's come to this uh, generation mix with energy storage why do we need intervention of energy storage so this demand can be sufficed by the uh, so base load energy to storage okay so when we have excess storage and we when we have a demand then uh, picking energy from the storage okay so that can be picked up okay so this is the uh, relation between the uh, demand and supply gap okay so a system demand is here based uh, base load generation then uh, mid merit generation and peaking generation so base is what for example we have some power plants which lead hours to turn them on right or in some cases it may be say uh, tens of hours or in days it, the lead time is in days those power plants we cannot have uh, i mean uh, okay they, they cannot be turned on uh, with our demand itself so those are base load generations right and then we have uh, another mid uh, merit generations so they have hours of lead time. So we, if we want to switch them on, we need uh, say inter intimation for a couple of hours. Okay. So in that scenario, these are mid merit uh, generation power plants and the peaking power plants are into this. Okay. So what is uh, done over here is like, uh, so let's start over here. Storage charge from the base load generation. So we have these base load power plants generating, but since the demand is low, generation power flow out of uh, without storage is this, right? So excess, okay. So the power are power plants are generating in power up to this, but the actual demand is somewhere here. So excess uh, power has to be popped into the generation uh, profit with the storage. Okay. So this is what. Uh, has to be there when we have a lowest demand and the excess power generation is happening storage charge from the base load generation plants has, has to be there right so uh, that is one thing okay 
so this is the scenario meaning this is um, say storage kind of uh, quantity and what is here we have some peaker plants but beyond that if the demand surges that will be sufficed from the storage that has already taken place at some other form of energy right so this is what as what is called as typical variation and there were therefore we need intervention of energy storage okay uh, so far so good uh, yeah we need intervention of energy storage the national quantities are huge obviously and uh, when we talk about uh, different means of energy storage what are different possible uh, means of energy storage we have mechanical energy storage possibility thermal energy storage possibility then electrical energy storage poss possibility and chemical energy storage possibility okay so what is mechanical energy storage it's a mechanical mean for example flywheel it's a, again mechanical energy storage means right and when we talk about uh, say uh, say uh, hydroelectric power station and uh, we are talking about pumped hydro power station we will be lifting water from lower height to upper height right and when we want to have a, a demand to be sufficed we will release that water at upper height through the generator and that will be uh, taken to the water body at lower height and that gravitational um, uh, say mechanical uh, energy storage will be envisaged to generate the electricity okay so hydroelectricity is a typical example of again mechanical storage then we have a possibility of thermal storage um, possibly uh, patak ma'am has given you an overview of uh, thermal energy storage okay so what what happens in a typical uh, coal based or any steam generation power plant for that matter is uh, you generate steam you have steam turbines when turbines are rotated through that uh, steam to the energy of steam kinetic energy of steam we have mechanical shaft connected to the generator and that generator generates electricity so far so good right uh, but that uh, eventually what is a source of energy over there the thermal heating of steam and thus running your turbine so the generator generator when it is uh, uh, receiving that steam the steam can be from any source right uh, for example when we are talking about uh, uh, steam uh, so can steam be storage stored no we cannot store steam uh, and that's not that easy right so so what is the means of uh, storing that electrical uh, not electrical but uh, energy from that uh, uh, heating for example you want to uh, store solar energy solar energy has a peculiar uh, bell shape curve right so that bell shape curve tells us that morning nine there will be solar energy it will be maximum at noon and it will again fall down it is a bell shape curve it's a predictive i mean predeterminable uh, uh, or uh, predictable curve of solar energy but we need to suffice that uh, uh, demand of evening when the solar energy is not available so we can store that in the form of thermal energy that thermal energy uh, if we are storing it at 500 600 or 1000 degree celsius that eventually can be okay so how can you store that you use in the form of molten salts okay so the molten salts will store that thermal energy and that thermal energy can eventually be utilized to generate steam and run your power plant it's very again same conventional power plant okay so mechanical is there thermal is there then electrical energy storage okay so 
okay so uh, we'll not highlight this part so much because we are going to cover that in the other uh, means okay so chemical energy storage so we can have electrochemical uh, reactions that take place and those electrochemical reactions can eventually be uh, um, uh, okay so what we call as uh, call it as battery can be a device where electrochemical energy storage can happen right so that's uh, one more mean so we have main uh, uh, or other four main categories of uh, uh, energy storage mechanical thermal electrical and chemical so uh, battery energy storage is what so not too far uh, distant energy future is like uh, renewable energy smart grid and battery energy storage so all these things are coming together right nowadays we have uh, electric vehicles those are promoted in a big way so uh, how much is typical energy storage of uh, electric vehicle uh, for example when we are talking about tesla's uh, electric vehicle the car uh, they store about 60 kilowatt hours 60 units are stored in that uh, storage of uh, uh, Tesla car, right? Uh, what is typical uh, uh, battery rating of uh, Nexon EV? It's about 40, 40 kilowatt hours. Uh, what is typical storage uh, feasibility of electric scooter? Somewhere like uh, four to five kilowatt hours. Five units can be stored in that uh, battery. So this is vast potential so all these electric vehicles if those are plugged in uh, at the same time there will be a different again kind of new uh, variation in the demand that is come, going to come into picture so and that also uh, can tell us because uh, your devices uh, rather um, these electric vehicle devices itself are smart in their nature Meaning, they can tell us how much is exactly state of charge, SOC. And also, uh, a state of charge, if it is known, we can estimate is how, I mean, how much is the energy stored into those vehicles. Okay, so at demands, we can also request those uh, storage uh, vehicles, not storage vehicles, but electric vehicle to pump in demand or pump, pump in the electrical energy into the grid okay so that's also possible that's why many um, forward and reverse arrows are, are possible okay so energy battery storage renewable energies back and forth here the energy battery storage smart grid smart grid is what we are going to introduce that concept actually uh, it, it's eventually it's a smartness into this grid electrical grid that we just now talked about right so uh, so we are not uh, much uh, lagging for this kind of scenario where all these things are together. But we all know that uh, the uh, typical nature of these renewable sources are they, are, they are very much intermittent in nature. For example, let's talk about these typical uh, idealized daily output variations from a solar PV power plant. Okay, so this is morning, this is noon, and this is evening. The power output from this uh, solar uh, PV power plant is varying typically like this bell shape curve. That's what I just now talked about. So morning it will start, it will ramp up, it will be maximum in the noon, and it will again come down to its minimum. So this is for typical uh, idealized day, but life is not that simple every day, okay? Because every day is not Saturday. How the life varies? So uh, in a clear sky, a sunny day. So we have typical variation like this blue curve, very much close to what we have in the idealized scenario. But if it is overcast, uh, so the scenario can be like this, the green curve. And if it is rainy, the scenario can be again worse. Okay. Okay. So, 
is this the uh, I mean, I mean good scenario for us so this is a typical variation from solar uh, output but at the same time when you are talking about another uh, renewable source called as wind energy there also the variation is too much so at the morning 4 am there will be no wind virtually morning it will start again in the there in daytime there will be some variation typical pattern and evening it will again be less okay so that is typical variation of these renewables so the renewables are inherently intermittent in nature that's why we need certainly intervention of energy storage when we are talking about uh, sustainable or other sustainable comes later but renewable addition of uh, renewable energy addition of these uh, energy sources okay so when we are shifting from uh, conventional sources to these renewable sources we have to have certainly an intervention of uh, energy storage okay so with this i think we can have small break we already are, are at 12 30 and uh, let's have some interaction and maybe uh, so uh, this will be the uh, topic where we will continue Okay, so now I'm uh, available for interaction. Yeah, questions please. So maybe we can start with the context of our previous session where you have some questions. I'll certainly happy to take up those questions and the questions related to the topic that I have just now presented. Yeah, please go ahead. So are the questions typed in the chat box or uh, they can unmute themselves and ask the questions? Yes, uh, thank you uh, uh, Adinath sir uh, for taking this uh, break at the appropriate time. Uh, do we have questions? I, uh, I did not see any question coming up in the um, chat box as yet. Uh, so. Uh, if anyone wants to ask, just uh, raise your hand and then we can uh, uh, go ahead. Even we can uh, uh, hear that whatever questions you asked in the last previous uh, session. So many of that uh, it was said this week, uh, this uh, year time it will be said. So you can ask those questions as well. Yeah. Uh, I think that's just to just one question which I remember, uh, which was on the materials specifically, and uh, what are the materials which are used for energy, which can be used for energy storage and conversion? If you can throw some light on it, uh, it will be good. Okay, so okay, so materials for energy storage, right? Right. Yeah. So when we're talking about, we have to categorize either into, I mean, either of the, these four forms, right? So uh, if you want to have uh, uh, electrochemical energy storage, basically batteries, right? So batteries, we have a plethora of technologies actually. So at the moment, we can think of first and front runner, everyone that everyone knows is like lithium ion batteries. At the same time, there are many battery technologies that are on the uh, commercialization stage. Uh, like uh, flow batteries, uh, when are doing redox flow batteries and even in some cases they have commercialized the iron redox flow batteries. So these are uh, some one more uh, kind of material. Okay, so when we talk about vanadium uh, redox, redox flow batteries, V2O5, vanadium uh, is there, vanadium kind of compound. And uh, say when we are talking about um, iron redox flow batteries, it's purely something like um, uh, FeCl3, perichloride, and it uh, I mean gets their uh, oxidation and uh, oxidation states change from some to something to the other. But right, so uh, so if we uh, iron-based uh, electrolytes are there. So at the same time, it's is that only uh, I mean chemical, and we just get uh, energy stored. Is that no? There is there is a need of uh, say storage tank first of all, then the separator where the ion exchange is taking place, taking place, the chemical electrolytes, 
and uh, eventually the uh, pipes through which these corrosive uh, reactants can be flowed. Just an example. When we talk about lithium ion batteries, uh, so when we talk about uh, the weight of all the components or material com material in the elements in the uh, lithium ion battery, lithium is just two to three percent. What is there is cobalt. What is there more is uh, say uh, other kind of separators. What is there is electrolyte. So all these are some materials. So so these are materials uh, that are especially what I talked about battery. So eventually, for example, uh, when we are talking about uh, uh, another kind of storage, um, say for example, electrical storage, you no know, capacitor, super capacitor, or uh, EDLC, we talk call it as uh, electrical double layer capacitors. So there, the uh, say uh, the dielectric materials is uh, what is required to be. Uh, addressed right so these are diff for different uh, means of storage we have different uh, materials that are there uh, required for the uh, energy storage yeah so uh, some more questions i hope that answers swapnisa's question yes yes definitely uh, sir we have a question from uh, uday kumar uh, uh, sir he says, uh, what is the feasibility of lithium ion batteries for a long term use, say 15 years for specifically motor, uh, automobiles? Uh, actually, uh, yeah, it's a good question, actually. Uh, so, I mean, uh, it's already, I mean, from the beginning itself, though, I mean, the lithium ion uh, chemistry is much more promoted for these portable devices. Uh, the reason is simple. They do not add too much of uh, dead weight load. Uh, dead weight load of uh, the vehicle, right? Since their uh, specific capacity is very high. But uh, looking at the lithium ion and uh, the components, I mean, other materials that are used, I just now mentioned that it contains what it contains is lithium, then cobalt, and some other materials. But when we talk about India as a nation, uh, or let's talk about the worldwide scenario itself. The lithium, uh, out of 100%, uh, say 28% or 23 to 28% lithium is mined in China. The mining happens in China. Uh, rest is somewhere else, maybe Australia, maybe Chile, maybe some other nations uh, of the world. Okay, so when it comes to total uh, um, say uh, what is called as uh, purification or refineries almost 80 percent of refineries of lithium ion batteries are owned or controlled by china so is this a good scenario no obviously long, long for long term so this is again uh, so a new uh, new kind of middle east new middle east right so for as of now we were heavily dependent for these uh, co uh, I mean, uh, the oil based resources to the middle east right so we will be shifting that to someone else okay so that's what is the scenario and uh, yes this is the scenario and it's certainly not good right so we again uh, so how much is the capacity much is planned by government that there should be indigenous development but obviously we are in a global uh, kind of uh, market right so we are part of a global market so uh, whatever is uh, economical will be preferred by the consumers and obviously that the uh, whoever wins will be the winner so although we will be promoting indigenous manufacturing but there is a lot that has to be debated and will be decided by the market itself right so it's obviously it's not a good solution in a long, long run and that's what we must uh, I mean, appreciate that government has initiated new initiatives like hydrogen uh, mission has been launched this year itself so that was the uh, uh, kind of scenario right so we are shifting to uh, uh, something else okay so uh, hydrogen how much how, how hydrogen can be used for your transportation obviously that has different segments uh, recently you must have heard news that uh, NCL uh, National Chemical Laboratory then uh, KPIT and uh, um, under support of ministry they have launched a bus 
uh, based on the fuel cell electric way, I mean fuel cell. So fuel cell is what eventually it is utilizing hydrogen uh, and then uh, that hydrogen fuel cells are running, generating electricity and that electricity is powered uh, to drive your bus. Okay, so this is eventually something else that has to be thought of, right? So that's what is my opinion on this uh, fuel cell. Obviously, no uh, long run kind of uh, sustainable solution uh, can can come from the lithium and, and batteries. And uh, so to the scale that uh, market will require, obviously not, not at all. So uh, can I read the questions from me? Yes, uh, so yeah. I'll just read it for you. Uh, yeah. So the next question is uh, from Asmita Marathe. Mm -hmm. uh, she is uh, asking what is generally the return of investment if we use energy storage with one uh, megawatt uh, PV plant? Okay, so that's a good question actually. Uh, when we talk about energy storage, obviously, uh, so we have to uh, talk about uh, LCOE, Levelized Cost of Energy. And when we talk about energy storage from different uh, segment of storages, the LCOEs are different. So uh, specifically when we are talking about solar energy storage, but solar energy storage can have different means. Let's talk about uh, battery energy storage, BESS, battery energy storage systems. Uh, when we are talking about generation cost of solar PV, that is actual cost. So, I mean, though the bid says that at megawatt scale, we have in uh, rather uh, discovered, the government of India has discovered the rates of 1.99 rupees a kilowatt hour at commercial level at gigawatt scales. That's good scene. But actual cost, obviously it has several kind of subsidies, kind of promotions, uh, say, um, uh, say other costs and other things. But when we are talking about actual cost of generation of electricity from solar PV, it is somewhere between four to seven rupees a kilowatt hour. Okay, so that is one cost. When we are talking about uh, cost of energy storage through battery based battery energy storage systems, the cost is somewhere between 25 to 30 rupees a kilowatt hour. I'm talking about LCOE, levelized cost of energy storage. So battery based energy storage systems are costing us somewhere between 25 to 30 rupees. Yeah. Okay. So uh, to give, I mean, to compare those numbers with our commercially available electricity sources, meaning utility charges. So any household, uh, for example, Pune University, we are paying uh, at the rate of approximately 10 rupees a kilowatt hour, 10 rupees a unit. How about our household? Obviously, they are cheating us most of the time, uh, though they say that uh, your base rate between 100, 0 to 100 uh, kilowatt hour of usage, uh, they will be charging us at say 3.4 rupees a kilowatt hour, but actual, if you talk about number of units consumed and the actual bill charged to us, uh, it comes up, comes about somewhere between 7 to 10 rupees a kilowatt hour. Okay, so that is typically cost, typical cost of uh, electricity that we are getting out from the without any we do not uh, own any storage source we do we just uh, buy it whenever we need it right so from utility we are getting it at 10 rupees a kilowatt hour and uh, the storage costs are somewhere between 25 to 30 let's consider the lowest cost if it is 25 and you are adding the generation cost of say 5 rupees that eventually costs 30 rupees a kilowatt hour so that's what is my analysis. So, um, yeah, in that case, storage with PV is not advisable? Yes, it's advisable only when it is uh, commercially viable. So, for example, if come the, if it comes down to the cost of, say, two of, say, 15 rupees a kilowatt hour, and then with some capital subsidy or incentivization, if we are able to bring that to a parity of our grid uh, in electricity, then there will be quantum jump uh, towards these technologies for energy storage. That's what is my reading. Okay, okay. Thank you very Thank much. You.
Uh, thank you, Asmita, for continuing and clearing your doubts. Uh, next question is by Binandan. Uh, he says, uh, if you can highlight the future of fuel cells and pumped hydrogen storage in comparison to the rechargeable batteries. Okay, so these are two different technologies. We cannot compare them on the same table. Uh, so let's start with one by them, one of them. So let's start with the pumped hydrogen is, uh, energy storage. Obviously, the round trip efficiency is estimated to be somewhere between 65% to 70%. Round trip efficiency of a pump hydro storage. Okay, that's good number. But uh, what size of uh, I mean, installation do we require? We need a huge storage facility. That means dam, huh, typically. So the dam are the, not that really uh, good kind of scenario because to build a dam, we know that it costs much to our environment. It costs much to national resources and uh, to look, I mean, relocate that kind of populace and whatever uh, is there, it takes huge, uh, huge efforts. Uh, but I mean, obviously the round trip, we are talking about the round trip efficiency and other thing. This is the scenario with pumped hydro energy storage. But uh, is, is this a really uh, good kind of uh, storage? Yes, it's very good storage because the lead time is in minutes. So whenever you need it, it, it can be just switched on with uh, say uh, minutes of lead time or at the most hours if it is, no, not hours are not needed. It's a lead time is in minutes only. One thing. Okay, so let's go with the second, the fuel cell. So uh, fuel cell are no, not really a, a storage device for that matter. They are just conversion devices. The storage will be in the form of maybe hydrogen, if it is a proton exchange member and hydrogen based fuel cell, right? So, okay. So if it is a fuel cell, the future of fuel cell, I certainly see uh, much of bright future, but my notion will not uh, drive the technology. Uh, it will be decided by the technology because as of now, if we go into details of the fuel cell, there are many gray areas and many uh, technological challenges. For example, the distribution of this hydrogen over the, uh, say, uh, over the membrane itself. So that there is a kind of even distribution at the same, same time, effective, rather efficient use of uh, hydrogen. And there are many other challenges, technological challenges that are needed. Okay, so that's what is my view on those two things. Yes, uh, thank you, Adinath. I think uh, the uh, last question is, uh, which was previously asked by Dr. Shweta as well. Uh, out of the first, second and the third generation, uh, that is silicon-based GCD or uh, D. SSC PV cells, which may be the most suitable uh, for the future generations? Uh, again, good question. I must say, uh, yeah, good question for the matter that, matter of fact that we are obviously, I think we are talking about the uh, solar photovoltaic technology over here. The solar photovoltaic technology in a commercial market as of now, if you can say, uh, say, Three years back, the scene was like 96%. It is dominated by silicon. Again, uh, so as of now, it is again the domination has been further. Um, I mean, more 97%. That is dominated by silicon technology, and at the horizon, if we are the topics that uh, Shweta Ma'am has mentioned, cadmium telluride. Uh, no, cadmium telluride are not mentioned, but germanate, GTD is not there, scatel, cadmium telluride. Okay, so 96% uh, silicon, those 4% thin film, out of that thin film, almost 90% is cadmium telluride, uh, right? So this cadmium telluride is the only thin film technology which is commercially uh, at better scale. Then amorphous silicon and other kind of thin film technologies are there. So as of now, for a, for a future, when we say that, okay, what is the future of this technology? Obviously, silicon is the best one because they have grown mature over the years. As of now, commercially level modules, we are efficiency of 20, more than 25% in some cases. 
and there are many technological advancements in these technologies. Okay, 25% does not sound good, but if we are talking about different limitations that are possible to harness 100% of solar, for, uh, I mean, uh, radiant light, I mean, there is re really a challenge. Now, people have demonstrated efficiency, high sufficiency of say more than 48% in some cases, but that is for lab scale uh, product. And um, the size of devices are 1 mm, 2 mm by 3 mm or something like that. Obviously, to take them to commercial scale, uh, the cost will be horrendously high, tremendously high and may not uh, help us uh, in commercializing that kind of technology. But, so as of now, Anubhishikta Samrat or the sole emperor of this technology, solar photo technology is silicon only. Obviously, there are certain advantages of uh, silicon also. Silicon is second most abundant element on earth crust after oxygen. So virtually no limitation on resource availability. It's mostly available everywhere. Uh, if you are talk, comparing with that with thin film of cadmium telluride, cadmium is always uh, being a heavy metal. It's toxic to environment and to uh, human life also. Hazardous, right? It's a carcinogen, known carcinogen, cadmium, right? So there are um, many advantages of silicon over other kind of technology. So, sole emperor silicon for now. I do not see anyone in the horizon. Konatsa challenge Nitala. Thank you. And what about the dye-sensitized solar cell? I think uh, in Switzerland, dye-sensitized solar cells are built up to more than 25% efficiency of solar radiation conversion. Yeah, so uh, that's good uh, input. Yes, I, yes, there are many demonstrations as well. But again, they are to bring them to commercial scale. And when we talk about, yes, though the investment will be very similar to present uh, silicon, but silicon work for the timeline of 25 years. After 25 years, their efficiency drops down to 80%. It's not zero. But how about those uh, demonstrations of disensitized solar cells? Their life is not beyond hours demonstrated as of. So a couple of hours, it cannot be compared with 25 years, right? So there is a lot long way for these new technologies that to be uh, considered as really competitive. Yeah. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you, Dr. Adinath. I believe yeah. that was uh, one interesting question that we had. Mm -hmm. uh, there, is, there are uh, two more uh, comments uh, by Abhinandan. Uh, are uh, 24 by 7 off-grid hybrid system with battery backups practically feasible in remote locations? Yes, 100% feasible. And that was the only possibility uh, by which government of India has been able to uh, demonstrate uh, the uh, so reach of electricity to those uh, I mean uh, households. Otherwise, there were many households within India itself which were have which have not seen the uh, the electricity of any form. Okay, so and uh, the concept of microgrid that has really you know evolved from those uh, kind of off grid systems only. Okay, so it I mean it's really a very uh, convivial. A uh, very fantastic idea to have off-grid systems as well as smart, uh, say what is called as um, uh, micro uh, microgrids, right? So these are very uh, nice concepts. Yes, it's really possible. Obviously, one has to uh, I mean uh, uh, assess the the load curve, and thus we have to design our reserve, meaning the storage battery uh, systems for that matter. Yes, it is very much possible. Uh, right. Uh, uh, Abhinandan has uh, another query, like one of the major drawbacks of EV batteries is the charging time as compared to the petrol or the diesel refilling units, which is just uh, put it and drive away. So uh, what is the solution that you can suggest uh, so that this time lag, uh, which is induced by the battery charging can be overcome? Okay, the, the quick comparison is just with, uh, okay, we'll compare with our present scenario. We go there. Uh, we have stored energy packets. What are those in stored energy packets? 
uh, the dispensing uh, pump, right? So that delivers that energy packets into our fuel tank and we utilize, we just um, th that happens within a span of say five minutes itself, right? So with, uh, with kind of scenario, similar scenario, what we should be in position to do, uh, okay, it takes, I mean, the energy is dropped uh, in our uh, electric vehicle uh, batteries very slowly. That's what is the concern at the moment. So what's the best possible way? Okay, you just remove that tank itself, put up the tank which is filled up with this electrical energy at whatever rate it is convenient for that uh, storage tank meaning swapping of batteries. That, that's what I see as a, uh, a good kind of possibility. But there are many kind of uh, challenges in this kind of scenario also. Say, so all manufacturers have their own kind of way of uh, designing all these uh, power trains, uh, then the, uh, these, uh, these motors and several other components of the electric vehicle. So to come to a, a common uh, solution, Obviously, I think the uh, good news uh, for in this scenario is like bounce. If you have heard of it, uh, bounce is the uh, I mean, uh, uh, I mean share uh, share uh, ride sharing kind of uh, company that was there in Bangalore, but they have come up with a solution that you do not need to own battery for your scooter. You just buy the scooter and just I um, mean you will be delivered uh, batteries like uh, your uh, filling up your uh, power, uh, like your fueling station of your uh, uh, petrol, right? So similar kind of scenario is possible. So uh, that's what is my reading and uh, I, uh, okay, thank you so much. Yes, uh, thank you, Dr. Adina. That was, uh, uh, that we had a very good uh, discussion, like uh, we almost had uh, 25 good minutes of uh, discussions. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. It's that is what uh, that is what is required when we are having interdisciplinary related uh, discussions. It's always good to be based on discussions over uh, yeah, like uh, sometimes the sessions become monotonous. Right. So uh, if you can just proceed with the rest of the uh, part, we can take sure. the questions at the end. Thank you so much. So I'll go for the uh, rest remaining part of my presentation yes please so and uh, let's talk uh, what time uh, 12 45 i'll uh, no it's um, it's, uh, it's still 1 30 right yes yes so, so maybe so, you can uh, uh, little beyond one i'll be uh, stopping my presentation right sure 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 you can take uh, 15 more minutes and then we can have q and a right sir Okay, so uh, taking things further, we were here that uh, uh, we need intervention of energy storage uh, in order to push the two drives called as sustainable energy and at the same time we also need uh, uh, kind of new energy sources which are uh, there at our disposal. Okay, so we need intervention of energy storage. So just now we were discussing, right? So these are also energy storage means but uh, wood is storing at certain uh, energy. Uh, so this is uh, energy density of those fuels, right? Wood, coal, petrol, propane, methane, uranium. All these are energy sources and these are storage media for, for that matter, right? So they have their own energy storage, meaning uh, 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 what is called as, uh, so heat of combustion uh, in some cases or heat, um, calorific value for that matter. Okay. Uh, Dr. So, Adina, uh, if yeah, I can just interrupt you, uh, can you please go to uh, uh, full screen mode, uh, presentation oh, mode? Sir. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Okay, I'll just try. Yeah, so uh, so it's it's again, uh, I'm sorry again. Uh, Thank you, sir. Please continue. Yeah. So uh, what kind of energy storage do we need? So we do we need this kind of storage? No, it's already there with us and we can do, we are using it extensively but we need some secondary energy storage. These are primary energy storages for that, for that matter, right? But we need intervention of energy storage, which is secondary energy storage. And we just now have listed that there are four means of secondary energy storage. Okay, so the intermediate unit, therefore, has to be able to separate partly or completely. Actually, the sir, process. your screen is not visible. 
sorry sir uh, your screen is not visible so so is that the case with it, it is visible at our end uh, visible yeah possibly the internet connection is causing problem or you can please just relog in so that it will be visible thank you sir yeah so uh, this intermediate unit there is some i mean required obviously and we need that secondary energy storage and uh, obviously uh, so what is the function charge store and then discharge when we are talking about their scales their scales are different so for example in a flywheel we cannot store it for virtually uh, days right so days cannot be stored i mean days energy uh, for say couple of days we cannot store that in the flywheels right so these are the uh, i mean again there are some uh, parameters that that decide that what should be the means of energy storage and obviously what are the components power transformation system central store and charge discharge control system obviously what is okay again it is again kind of bookish uh, kind of uh, or theoretical concept but this is what is the typical approach of this system so what, there are two ways uh, um, the schematic diagram of the position of energy storage device within the system we have conventional system and then we have series connected systems um, say uh, supply side obviously we have generators we have transmission line and the demand side yeah so the demand side and there in between there comes a storage uh, conventional energy storage systems okay so we also have possibility to have supply side demand side and energy storage combined with transmission line okay so this uh, can be either conventional or semi series connected kind of systems okay so these are two ways so this is conventional storage there will be separate storage system there will be obviously inflow and outflow of that storage medium and we have series connected systems itself right so we have a supply we store it in the form of bat i mean electrochemical energy storage for example and we uh, suffice that demand uh, with whatever is the possible way right okay so uh, uh, i think let's not uh, highlight these topics too much since uh, we already have uh, um, given these uh, i mean given a thought on these different means of storage uh, there are thermal mechanical chemical and electrical energy storage right so we need energy storage intervention of energy storage for say some some examples are frequency regulation then community energy storage that's what one uh, respected sir has uh, discussed about then residential energy storage then peak shifting and load leveling so all these are the applications of your energy storage systems right so frequency regulation is what if your demand and generation are different there will be too much variation in the frequency uh power electric or power engineers or electrical engineers will know this concept but let's not get into details of that uh, kind of uh, scenario but we just know note that if the demand and supply are not matching there will be tremendous pressure uh, on this frequency right so uh, to have a regulation uh, as a regulation the frequency for example in india cannot vary between or rather beyond um, 0.1 hertz uh, okay obviously the regulations are there uh, i i'm not uh, i mean i don't have those numbers handy but i can certainly share those with you but there is a say for example so i showed that 0.1 hertz so it has to i mean in an idealistic case it has to be a 50 hertz itself okay so there will be some tolerance that is allowed but despite of that if the variations are too much there will that will lead to variation in frequency right which is not allowed as per grid code then community energy storage uh, for example uh, the rural household or uh, uh, a household where uh, the electricity has not reached as i mean so far can be lit up by those uh, community energy storage devices 
then residential uh, energy storage for example i want to live uh, off grid life is it possible for us yes it is possible and we can have certainly but obviously problem at the moment is like uh, the battery based energy storage system cost us something somewhere between 25 to 30 rupees a kilowatt hour a unit right that is what is the levelized cost of energy we are for a battery based system right so if that is brought down uh, significantly there is again uh, certainly a good scope for flourishment of that kind of technology peak shifting obviously solar generation is maximum in the daytime but this demand has to be sufficed for the uh, evening time right so peak shifting load leveling obviously we just now talked about uh, different power plants peaker power plants and base load power plants so that is also required there right so what are parameters that decide the choice of your energy storage system energy density per mass or volume for example people talk about lithium ion batteries but is the only the technology no conventionally we though we know that for 100 years lead acid based technology was there and it is still there for most of the application but what is problem with them the weight of that or other energy density per mass on uh, per volume of that technology right it's very small for lead acid but if we talk about uh, that uh, same kind of energy for lithium ion it's very much convivial right then cycle efficiency lead acid batteries does not go beyond 900 cycles lithium ion battery are very much robust and they run up to say 5000 and even in some cases 10000 cycles operation cycle efficiency is perfectly good meaning their round trip efficiency is beyond 95 percent for lead acid it's little less then uh, permissible number of charge discharge cycle so it, let's not discuss only that uh, so electrical electrochemical energy storage but we can have for example pumped hydro the round trip efficiency is or cycle efficiency is 65 to 70 percent right and uh, same for uh, say uh, when we are talking about the uh, flow, ba flow batteries the round trip efficiency is less than 80 percent right uh, we have other means of storage for example uh, compressed air energy storage there the round trip efficiency is different so these are some parameters for different technologies that are available as an energy storage then lifetime so uh, lead acid 900 cycles and if it is daily cycle how much is the life three years right when we are talking about 10,000 cycles 365 cycles a year how many cycles too many years right these are some of the parameters lifetime then uh, time of reverse and response time uh, level okay if it is pumped hydro hours then when we are talking about uh, say uh, thermal energy storage and which is again a uh, say steam based power plant there the the lead time will be at least hours say tens of hours right then optimal power output so if power can be drawn at whatever uh, uh, not whatever but at, at a predetermined rate that that's what is the parameter that also decides uh, the choice of energy storage system then optimal stored energy what is what can be the maximum uh, volume of uh, energy or other size of energy that can be stored and siting requirements for example can we have built a, a, a say a pumped hydro energy storage uh, site in pune city itself no we are struggling for every inch of uh, i mean uh, the uh, the space right and we are uh, coming up with high rise building there it's not possible virtually not possible even the resources are not there for example perennial stream and other kind of storage it will not be possible right so all these siting requirements are posing several problem or other uh, uh, one of the this is one of the parameter for choice of the energy storage system okay so before installing any uh, power system it takes tremendous efforts engineering and other things are already there let's not uh, highlight much in details but uh, store energy could be deployed for uh, one or many of the reasons okay so obviously we have touched it uh, we will not highlight this too much right 
there are two different types of energy hybrid and combined okay this also is little bit i just want to go further for something called as so this is obviously we have already covered uh, and i'll just go now to concept called as uh, okay so obviously let's have summary of different energy source systems uh, energy storage systems for that matter now so this is good uh, uh, plot where we can see that discharged time at rated power for example we have a flow battery for example flow batteries they take hours of operation uh, hours of lead time to come to their optimal power uh, delivery rate and uh, what kind uh, size of storage system power rating can be designed in megawatts starting with say 100 kilowatts to say 10 megawatts that can be the size of your flow batteries uh, energy storage system what about uh, uh, the fastest possible seconds so high power super capacitor that is the fastest one then flywheel they are the again fastest in their discharge time nickel cadmium battery nickel metal battery lead acid battery lithium ion battery all these things are uh, uh, growing up in their time scale okay so pumped hydro at least it takes hours for of it of, of its uh, power to be delivered but the good thing is that good news is that we can have highest uh, i mean as much as uh, rather highest possible size of your storage system okay and second is compressed air energy storage so the the i mean the energy storage system that one would prefer has to have so if you want to have very much higher power and higher uh, rather smallest discharge time one has to be somewhere here but since it is not possible and there are very few technologies that are possible to do it so this is also the linearity curve is also good to follow right so these are different energy storage means and we also have uh, classified them into mechanical thermal electrical and electrochemical and also new cell new technologies that are coming up are hydrogen related so these are classified so for example thermal cryogenic energy storage or thermal energy storage then we have electrical energy storage so super capacitor high voltage super capacitor these are electrical energy storage devices then electrochemical all kind of batteries are electrochemical devices then uh, mechanical compressed air then pumped hydro flywheels these are mechanical right so these are different classification or the panoramic view of all energy storage systems and what are different applications reverse and response services since they are the okay so uh, they are in this section so uh, transmission and distribution support so second size of your uh, power plants can help us uh, storage for transmission and distribution grid support then we have uh, bulk power management so that's that needs the size of say up to gigawatt right so these are some different means of energy storage and in a panoramic view of the different energy storage systems so uh, we are i think we are all set and done uh, obviously again repeating of some of the uh, concept so i'll just introduce you the concept of smart grid so smart grid is something uh, it's not uh, Okay, the name itself suggested that it is smart, right? It has some intelligence. Okay, so what is it? Let's see. So basically smart grid is what? We, conventional way is what? Providing electricity. So this is the, uh, I mean, this is the, uh, this is the role of your conventional utility, right? So utility, I mean, the role of utility is to provide electricity. But we nowadays have very much uh, backup of uh, information technology and that information technology and providing electricity, if they are having some kind, something as a common, that is called as smart grid. It's as simple as that to understand. So we add smartness to the conventional uh, uh, electricity supply 
chain. Okay, so you we add uh, analysis of data, we add um, intelligence as to let us if something is um, uh, demanding more, we can exactly know what is it uh, demand going to demand the size, how much time will it last, meaning the demand, how much long the dem uh, how how long the demand will last last. So all these uh, parameters are coming as information technology and if we are in position to uh, uh, rather uh, have a correlation with this uh, supply network then that is nothing but our smart grid okay so what is smart grid again it's an electrical uh, grid with automation communication and it systems so why why it is uh, very much uh, okay obviously i have taken all these things from uh, uh, smart grid uh, forum of india okay so we all know that what is it basically uh, we have these uh, communication devices where are these communication devices installed okay so nowadays we have uh, household requirement we have power i mean solar pv installed on our rooftop which is having a net meter then we have uh, electric vehicle then we have commercial spaces then we have uh, yeah so other kind of uh, office requirements then we have power generation station we have transmission network we have power plants based on solar photovoltaics we have power plants based on wind we have power plants based on nuclear power station or thermal power stations for that matter we have uh, say uh, uh, step up step up and step down kind of phenomena we have possibility to store energy uh, in the electrochemical electrochemical means in battery based energy storage systems and a central station will know all these parameter functionality of all these parameter uh, rather individual uh, stakeholders right so this is not nothing but integrating all these uh, communication devices into a central network uh, called as uh, smart grid okay so uh, uh, what are advantages there are several advantages because uh, it has several positive features that have given direct benefit to customer real-time monitoring because uh, we can really know if solar was envisaged at certain rate but because of some reason if it has got failure for example uh, inverter has failed. Now we know that inverter uh, uh, uptime, I mean, uh, bringing back into function, it takes some time. Okay, so our system knows how much time will it take for that uh, particular component to bring back to its functionality. So these are some components, right? So automated outage management and uh, faster restoration. Yes, it is possible only with the smart grid. Okay, dynamic pricing mechanism. If at certain, uh, uh, yes, then it is already observed for uh, say industrial consumers, uh, they are charged at differential rates, meaning uh, there are four time zones uh, in our, uh, uh, even in commercial and on kind of uh, high tension uh, electricity uh, supply. So TOD, time of day tariffs are different. For example, if you are utilizing at, we have seen that the demand reaches minimum at 4 a.m., right? So at that time, the electricity charges will be different. But at evening and morning time, you have sudden surge and the peak. Both things are happening. There you are charged at different rate, okay? So time of day tariff and uh, say all these things dynamic pricing mechanism can be designed devised so you will be charged at a different rate when you are consuming energy at 4 am and you will be charged at different time when you will be consuming at evening 6 a, 6 pm or somewhere between 6 to 7 pm right so that is dynamic pricing mechanism that can be actualized using the smart grid uh, okay small so in house display of uh, energy consumption generation of individual components of the house uh, can be battery by energy management all these things are possible with the smart grid okay so uh, 
so this is for your end user and uh, overall picture but uh, for uh, so there are added some many added advantages uh, for the grid operators as well right so i will not highlight too much of this so there are many benefits uh, of this smart grid so basically monitor and control uh, happens through i mean and that uh, leads to better efficiency then more reliability and easier balance and uh, uh, demand and supply so these are main activities or benefits from a smart grid so, so we have less electrical losses in the system a more efficient system uh, less expensive uh, for the utility and less expense uh, for the consumer obviously so that is the uh, added advantage uh, but, but since it is a uh, kind of uh, at the stage of evolution yeah it has certainly has some uh, kind of uh, so what you call as uh, so return on investment right so if you need to have addition of some uh, smart devices but that comes at a cost right and that cost has to be uh, correlated with how much will be benefit of that addition of that device right so all these things are already to be covered into picture and that's what is called as a smart grid so features and benefits of smart grid identify fault failing improvement since we have track of each and every component of the uh, whole picture then uh, isolate the problem so if there is some problem and if some particular identified uh, so, I mean, component has failed, we can isolate that problem and quickly uh, resolve that problem, right? So rerouting of these power flows can also be possible. So faster restoration of outage, better overall reliability are the added advantages of these smart grid, smart devices. So what is smart device? How, where does it start? Let's start some. I mean, start understanding some of the components of your uh, smart grid system. So, some of the components are uh, say, let's start with the um, the meter. Okay. So, conventional meter is uh, a one-way meter, right? So, electrical utility supplies power to the consumer, and the inflow to the consumer's um, facility is recorded so that is the uh, use of your conventional uh, uh, relationship okay so and it was metered accordingly but evolved relation in the present day scenario what has happened the electric utility is supplying power to consumer but at the same time if a consumer has installed a rooftop solar pv system the consumer is also in possible uh, possibility to export that excess electricity into the grid so bi-directional so we need to have a net meter right so this is nothing but a evolved relation this is evolved with time right so there has to uh, 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 some intervention of uh, all these and this is certainly a, a good kind of uh, empowerment of the consumer as well right so because consumer can, can add its his own uh, uh, cap, for example rooftop solar pv that we were talking about it's a renewable right and uh, it's empowerment to the customer itself right because he will be saving for example if he installs his own power plant solar pv power plant the energy that he will be generating is typically at uh, 4 rupees just we now discussed okay so obviously it is a levelized cost of energy but uh, the electricity uh, that which was otherwise to come from uh, the utility was to be levied at 10 rupees. So there is clear cut saving of 6 rupees per unit uh, for the customer, right? So these are many empowerments to the customer. Uh, so uh, analog uh, uh, meters, so AMI and a, uh, AMR, right? So all these are uh, some concepts. So analog or conventional meters typically read uh, only monthly, read uh, manually, we have meter readers, then blind about direction, whether it is uh, the power is uh, coming inside the facility of customer or it is going out of the customer's facility. It is uh, 
um, it is blind about that direction and you will be charged for outflow of electricity also right so this is a problem for us uh, but smart meters can measure uh, intervals of uses so uh, what is your typical pattern of uses that also will be known. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, we can read them remotely. Uh, that can account import, export, and monitors the reliability. Yeah. So uh, okay. So uh, okay. So what are the problems with this, uh, these conventional uh, meters? The wrong metering. Maharashtra man gets uh, rupees eighty crore electricity bill. Rush to hospital with high blood pressure. Okay. So these are some 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 uh, drawbacks of our conventional or hypothetical meter. Okay, so instead of this uh, conventional meter, if there was a smart meter, everyone was empowered to have rectification of that problem, right? So these are many advantages. Obviously, there are some many, many other. So uh, one-way meters are AMR, automated meter reading, and two-way meters are advanced metering infrastructure. So, so there is a project of uh, Ministry of Grid, uh, Smart Grid Mission uh, is already launched in India. And uh, so more than 3 million uh, smart meters have deployed, have been deployed in India. So obviously at the moment they have identified uh, pockets and smart, smart cities are already identified and their things are already happening. And uh, it will be evolved to the greater extent at other scales also. Okay, I think uh, with our... Uh, premise uh, uh, so with, uh, to follow our timeline uh, let me stop at this moment and uh, so we had some other okay so i was about to discuss the concept called microgrid but since uh, time is not permitting us let's conclude our uh, uh, lecture yeah so microgrids are a good one and uh, there are many advantages of microgrid and let me conclude our today's lecture. So let's come to some question Q and A. If you have uh, some questions left for me to answer, okay. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Adinath. It was a wonderful uh, hearing the positive and at the climax the funny and sad part, <laughs> <laughs> unfortunate events. But uh, there is definitely a scope of uh, many more uh, research that, like you suggested. There's a smart uh, grid components, which will, right. especially in the meters domain, they may be coming up, right. so, which may be influencing common man uh, to a very right. large, large extent. Yes. Yeah. So uh, the forum is now open. And uh, if you have questions, please drop in a, a query. Or if you would like to ans uh, ask the question directly, please raise your, raise your hand. So I think everyone, are... yeah, I think everyone is waiting for lunch. <laughs> <laughs> so actually, today we are having more of compliments uh, or queries, but it's good uh, that we had participants who have uh, heard you in the discussion, and definitely uh, it is the compliments which are pouring in. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, Nandi sir, you want to add something here? No, no. So I was doing that thing only. So as there was a discussion in between. So majority of the thing are yeah. yeah. I think most of the quest, uh, queries have already been addressed. Yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, then uh, Adinath, why, why don't you tell us uh, what is the future that you see yourself in your personal capacity, mm -hmm. and uh, what all uh, expectations that you have uh, from the participants to take them with? And then when they close this uh, energy section today we advocate sustainability right we are i mean we are part of this uh, united nations charter right so promote all uh, as much as uh, green and renewable energy as possible second uh, sometimes we always uh, forget that okay so just switching the sources will do but at the same time, we should be very much. We are um, culturally Indian, right? So we believe in saving. So conservation is another possibility. So whenever not required, we can switch to switch of the appliances and uh, basically lighting. Okay, other appliances have their own requirement and they are cyclic, uh, for example, even your household also. Yeah, so switching sources and conservation 
will certainly be a help for our uh, 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 way forward we are aspiring we need i mean so in the scale of uh, united nations uh, energy consumption per capita though we not may not, we may not fit into that uh, exact criteria okay you if uh, someone is using uh, highest energy per capita that may not be exactly applicable to us because uh, uh, if you analyze the energy requirement uh, in some certain nations for Euro European or uh, uh, North American kind of scenarios, their most of their energy demand goes for space heating, meaning warming their, or warming their space in household, you know, offices, in buses, malls, everywhere. Okay, so I mean, if we I mean uh, eliminate those uh, energy embodiment, we we do not require that kind of space heating. So. I mean, so notwithstanding with any other kind of uh, uh, variation, since we require energy, and that is the indicator of uh, development, because better healthcare, better education system, and better livelihood that comes from several in-house gadgets. At the same time, uh, several other uh, facilities outside our house also. So energy demand will be ever rising, and we as an aspiring nation it will always be uh, on plus sides right so uh, and our population and several other things are already there right so considering that switching the sources and conserving the um, conventional uh, um, requirement so that will be my uh, uh, rather uh, request to take away and uh, follow as a mantra of our life thank you so much Thank you, Dr. Avina. That was a wonderful uh, takeaway. Uh, uh, by the way, uh, are you aware of uh, any such uh, activities? Like I came to know about uh, 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 certain startups which work only on this domain, like you mentioned, mm -hmm. of switching off uh, directly. Mm -hmm. So there are some startups which have come up uh, even in Pune University campus. They, they propagate that just uh, they want the home automation to come into picture. Mm -hmm. uh, Although it is like uh, taking up energy, another electric source altogether just to manage them. Do you think it would be a sustainable idea to have these uh, home automation? Yes, certain. it's certainly a good idea. But since it is taxing at the moment to the user, yes, we do get empowered, but uh, it taxes us, right? So we need to have some additional investment. Yes, I mean, uh, so our frugal ways will certainly be helping us. Okay, so if you want to, I mean, nowadays you certainly, so Alexa and Google Home and uh, there are many interconnected devices, all things are already coming into picture, right? But uh, so whoever is uh, in position to um, invest on that should certainly. So that's what is that. Yes. And um, it only adds to the reduction into the demand eventually, right? So, so position, I mean, rather, uh, yeah, occupancy-based sensors, all these things are, I mean, part of our smart devices, right? One should certainly go for if it is possible to him. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Adina, to be uh, being with us. I will uh, we'll be sharing uh, Dr. Adina's presentation uh, sometime by the end of the day. And uh, I am hopeful that if you have any queries, uh, Dr. Adina will be very happy to answer them even sure. by mail or by call, whatever suitable. And uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you, Dr. Adinath. And we'll catch up later. Uh, dear participants, uh, uh, thank you for being with us on the second se uh, second session of the day. Uh, we request uh, you to have a very good lunch and come back at the 3 o'clock session that we have. It's not on sustainability of the uh, physical entity, but rather ourselves, which uh, Dr. Somnath sir will be hosting. And we have a very uh, eminent speaker coming up uh, in uh, one and a half hours or so. So uh, have a good break and come back with uh, some more refreshed energy. Thank you so much. And you may uh, leave the call. Thank you. The call can be switched off. The recording can be closed. Uh,